Thank you, Hanan. How exciting. We are getting closer to the end of the first part of uh, today's program. And the following speaker is our keynote uh, speaker, MIT professor Nicholas Negroponte. And before uh, Nicholas begin, I would like to invite to the podium a member of the MIT Enterprise Forum Board, Professor Mayor Feder, a professor of uh, electronic engineering, and a repeat entrepreneur with Peach and Amimon. Mayor. Thank you. Thank you, Ella. <laughs> well done. Don't clap for me, it's for uh, Nicolas Negroponte. So it is uh, really my great honor to present today Professor Nicolas Negroponte. Uh, Nicolas Negroponte is the founder and chairman of the One Laptop Per Child Nonprofit Association. Uh, recently, Professor Negroponte also agreed to be the chairman of the Global Literacy X Prize, which again represents his passion on this field. Yet, for me, as an MIT graduate, uh, the name uh, Nicolas Negroponte is always associated with MIT. Uh, he is indeed a graduate of MIT. Uh, he was then a pioneer in the field of computer-aided design. He has been a member of the MIT faculty since 1966. Now, um, the most related thing to Professor Negroponte is, of course, the Media Lab. The Media Lab was conceived in 1980 and it opened its door in 1985 where Nicolas Negroponte was the pioneer and the, the co-founder and the director of this MIT famous media lab. Uh, in addition to um, his, his work in the MIT media lab and in MIT, uh, he was the author of the 1995 bestseller Being Digital, which has been translated to more than 40 languages. Um, he was also involved in the industry and the private sector. Uh, he served as a member of the board of directors of Motorola and Company. And he was a general partner in a venture capital firm specializing in digital technologies for information and entertainment, which has provided startup funds for more than 40 companies, including the Wired magazine. So after all those words, please join me to welcome Professor Negroponte for his talk uh, on the future according to MIT. Professor Negroponte. Thank you. How many people went to MIT in this room? Oh, it's, it's, oh you want me to? And where am I controlling the slides from? Okay, thank you. Um, well, I can't tell you where the future is according to MIT. MIT is a very big place. But I've been there long enough that uh, I can say with some authority that it's been the birthplace for mm, a, lot of, a lot of ideas. It's been the birthplace for a lot of ideas, a lot of startup companies, and it's been a wonderful, I've been, Okay. I try and turn it off. Um, okay. Can anybody turn this mic off? off I see. See why? You think that was the feedback? Okay. Um, so what I'm going to do is, since I'm talking twice, I'm going to use the first half to discuss where new ideas come from, and then I'm going to obviously use. If I don't get feedback. I'm going to obviously use the MIT Media Lab as an example, and I'll take things out of history and some of the things that are going on now. And then I will use the second half hour that I have to tell you what I'm doing and uh, uh, what I think is going to happen uh, in that area. But I wanted to start reaching back quite far in history, because when I thought uh, about this talk, I realized that there were two very important influences uh, on my life, on my, when I actually did research, uh, that were Israeli. 
And one of them is partly because I studied architecture. And I hope many people who are advising younger people to look at careers, look very carefully at design. Because design provides a lot of the core for what subsequently becomes entrepreneurship, innovation, and so on. In my case, I actually went to school thinking I would be an architect. And it was a mistake. I wasn't gonna, didn't turn up being an architect, but it wasn't a mistake in terms of going to design school. In fact, I'll tell you a personal story. Uh, when I was in high school, I went to see the headmaster of my high school and said, look, look I've done well in mathematics and I've done well in art, so clearly I should go into architecture. And he looked at me and he said, and this went right over my head, he said, I like gray suits and I like pinstripe suits, but I hate gray pinstripe suits. <laughs> and it didn't, it just didn't dawn on me until about my third or fourth year in architecture school that for me the gray pinstripe suit was computers. That where art and mathematics would intersect, they weren't at the moment, was in computation. But I mentioned that I, was, I had been influenced by Israel twice in my life. While I was a young student, there was a slightly older student named Moshe Safte who had just designed Habitat. And Habitat, he designed it when he was 23 years old. And in 1986, I remember going to see it. And all of us in the design studios at that time were copying Moshe Safte. We were going out and bought more sugar cubes than you can imagine just for making models out of. And when I did my first computer program, it was a diminutive Moshe Safte generating system that you could make things uh, on computer screens, which at the time were quite rare. The size of the computer driving this particular display was bigger than this room. And I remember since I would operate it by myself, which should have been illegal but wasn't, um, I would run from one side of the room to the other side of the room because I only had so many minutes and I didn't want to waste too much time walking. When I spent more time at, media, at, at MIT, this was done partly outside of MIT, I, have, I started the Media Lab with a partner. And I'm always referred to as the co-founder, but very few people ask who was the other founder. Now, some of you might know, but most of you don't. The other founder happened to be the president of MIT. Now, when the president of MIT is your co-founder, think of it like driving a car too fast, but you've got a gorilla in the passenger seat and a policeman stops you, looks in the window, and says, excuse me, please keep speeding. <laughs> Namely, my co-founder not only was a wonderful partner, but there was no speed limit. And there was, before we actually found it, the second influence that came from Israel in 1976, the Entebbe raid. That raid was so extraordinary the United States government said, wait a moment, why can't we do that? And one of the reasons the Entebbe raid worked, at least we were told, is that there was a lot of practice, that people had practiced on physical models of the airport because the airport had been built by Israeli engineers and the plans existed. Now, maybe there's somebody in the room that knows even more details, and you can tell me later whether that's true or not. It doesn't matter if it's true or not. The United States government thought it was. And what they said was, how can we do that computationally? How can we make it such that people could have the experience of being someplace without having been there? and have all the knowledge that comes with knowing what's around the corner and, and knowing it experientially. And of course, when they, they asked for people to bid on that, 
I always said yes. No matter what people asked us to bid on, we'd say yes. Which is, again, perhaps one of the elements of having the gorilla in the front seat or the element of sheer gall. But we built, at the time, a, what we called a movie map, because video discs had just come out, that allowed you, in this case, to drive through the streets of Aspen. And I won't go through all of the details, but guess what? 30 years later, you have uh, Google that's done exactly the same thing. This was, our, this was our movie map device in 1978, and this is theirs today. So one of the reasons that a place like MIT exists is to do this sort of thing in a risk-free environment with as many different points of view. So I said I would talk about where do new ideas come from. There's a single answer. There's a one-word answer. And the answer is differences. If you have enough differences, differences of age, difference of point of view, difference of culture, difference of expertise, difference, all these things, and you have them in one place, you're guaranteed to have enough complexity and contradiction to have new ideas spewing out all the time. It's just your job to recognize them. And that's very, very important. One of the reasons big companies have trouble doing that and little companies and startups are needed, in big companies, think of it this way, 50% of the people manage the other 50%. The 50% being managed are spending 50% of their time being managed. So the net net is 25%. So when you compete, even with AOL now, you're really competing with 25%. And the system, again, normally doesn't lend itself uh, to innovation and uh, entrepreneurship. So what happened? We decided to put this new lab together. Why? Because the man's name, I should have mentioned it, was Jerry Wiesner. Jerry Wiesner was the last president to have a chauffeur. Now, why is that important? The chauffeur, Mr. Tibbs, parked his car at the bottom of the elevator that originated in our laboratory. So the president of MIT, I was a young, somewhat nervous assistant professor, would march his lunch guests through our laboratory to go down to the car to go off for lunch. And after about a year and a half of seeing things like this and other stuff that's very photo that was at the time very photogenic, he said, let's build a lab that has no direct academic department, but is the kind of place that I, and he was talking about himself, would want to do research. And what, for those of you who went to MIT, you'll know this, but it's, it'll sound like a detail, but it isn't. MIT, like most universities, has departments that are organized in schools, and the academic departments have all the power. They admit students, they award degrees, they hire faculty, they give tenure, et cetera, et cetera. But there's another perpendicular organization that are the labs. And the labs have all the money, but none of the power. And these checks and balances are purposely set up that way. And it's, it's very typical. If you know MIT faculty, they might be in electrical engineering and computer science. They might be in mathematics. But they'll work in the, the, you know, the artificial intelligence laboratory, et cetera. So the reason I mention that is that at the time, let me get to perhaps, well, let me, let me go back. At the time, I said, OK, we'll do this on the condition you allow us to be both a department and a lab. Not as a power play, not because you wanted to, to be both church and state, though that was sort of convenient, but because you wanted to be able to admit students who wouldn't normally come to MIT hire faculty who wouldn't normally apply to MIT, give tenure to faculty who'd never get it otherwise, and award degrees, and do this in the context of a research environment. So the sorts of things we did and the people who started it were all outside or at the edge of academic departments. And by that I mean 
the people who were in film video, music, Marvin Minsky joined us from artificial intelligence, Seymour Papert was in mathematics. You had people who were at the fringes of their department. So it was really a salon des refusés, in a very literal sense. And probably not too many people in the room old enough to, to re either remember this or have known it. The rest of MIT thought this was silly, outright silly. It was all icing, no cake, that it was a bunch of people doing these movie maps of Aspen. And this, I show this because it was one of the first touch sensitive displays. And I remember people would come and touch the display and it was, this was a manual about bicycles and people would gasp. They would, you would hear air you know, going in and say, look at my goodness, you could touch a computer and it would be a display. Do you know how many stories were written about how stupid touch-sensitive displays were? They, three reasons not to use a touch-sensitive display. One, this, th these were technical articles. One, your finger isn't, doesn't have enough resolution. Two, that when you touch the screen, you're occluding some of it with your hand so you can't see. And three, which was the real death knell for touch-sensitive displays, is you'd get the screen dirty. <laughs> These were, I promise you, people actually published stories about that. We said, no, 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 it's actually very accurate. And, and, and we did one thing which nobody ever copied. This was a touch-sensitive display that was also pressure-sensitive because the coefficient of friction between your finger and glass is such that when you touch the screen, you can introduce forces uh, in the plane of the screen. And it was actually rather cool. You could imagine it for all sorts of games. And I'm sorry I don't have video to show it to you. And this was a, a, another project. I cannot tell you how criticized it was. And the reason I'm telling you these things is not just for memory lane, but most entrepreneurship comes in spite of what people tell you. And when it gets lots of criti criticism, people tell you the two key words, actually three. If somebody tells you it's impossible, go for it. If somebody says it's unrealistic, that's usually a badge of honor. I mean, because it, it's things that aren't realistic is, are the ones that people take. And then the third one I've already forgotten, so we'll think. <laughs> but this was, this was a spatial data management system where we thought that there's so many things that we remember spatially. Now maybe I'm more spatial than other people, but if you, in, you'd call back your office, let's say, and you say to your assistant, I forgot a phone number, but if you go into my office, there's a pile of papers slightly to the right of the telephone, about four papers down on the back of the yellow sheet written in green pen tail pen is a number, can you read it to me? That sort of thing happens a great deal, or at least it was used, we used it as the example. So we decided, and this was at the same time that Xerox PARC was doing its, its interface, we decided to use it to, to invent one that <clears throat> not only had little icons that were, that were on the screen graphically, but that were images of what you could touch. I don't know if I have a, uh, a blow up now of this icon down here. Sorry, uh, I don't think I have an, a blow up of it. That's a calculator. And when you touched that calculator, another calculator appeared on the screen and people said, Oh my goodness, to use an expensive computer to have a picture of a calculator that you could then calculate with, this really tops it. These guys, first of all, are <laughs> going to touch displays and then uh, have calculators. And what we did at the time, which again was part of disembodying computers, you have to try and imagine a world, first of all, before the internet in any sort of wide sense, um, I, we always used it. I was, in fact, there was a period where I believe I knew every single person on the internet. There were only three machines. We were one of them, and I knew the other guys. Um, the, 
but the, it was still, it was a terminal, it was a box, it was a computer, it was a thing, it was a rack. The idea of it being something you went into was just not on the radar. But again, people, it sort of led to sort of, again, crazy students doing crazy things and crazy faculty, again, with the gorilla in the passenger seat. So it helped a great deal. Oh, there's the calculator on the big, there it is, there's the calculator. I did keep a picture of it. Um, <clears throat> What that led to was big corporations deciding that they would hedge against the future. That one way for a big company to sort of, sort of be at least in the game is to have visiting rights and come and kind of look at the asylum and sort of the inmates are running it, but let's see what they're doing. And that was that was how we really got started. And what happened, these were, again, it's some of these pictures I had to pull off the web. This is, sorry it's not clear. This is um, the TV series, uh, Columbo. No reason for you to remember a name of a silly TV series, but when you touched it, this came up on the screen and then you could randomly access it. You could even switch, and people would just die of laughter when you just hit a little button and he started speaking Japanese instead of English, or to get him to go backwards, or to look at single frames. Stuff that, that was just not in people's imagination. And finally, we built the thing that sort of got everybody to, uh, to fund it or to believe in it, uh, which was way ahead of its time, but it was built on a principle that still carries forward today. And that is that if you have concurrent channels of communication, that you can disambiguate what somebody says because there's so much redundancy. So if you say, and this program was called Put That There, and if you could say the word that, which means nothing, but if you're pointing, it means something. If you are in a foreign country and don't speak the language well, but you're at dinner and it's things like the food and pass the bread and so on, there's so many things happening. Of course, the bread is there. Somebody's maybe looking at it. Somebody's asking you to pass it. There's just enough concurrency and redundancy that you can figure out exactly what somebody's saying. If you don't have a good command of the language, and they start talking about politics where all the subjects and objects are elsewhere in space and time, it's really hard. I mean, you have to have a very, very good command of language. So this was, it might interest you, connected speech. You could, without this, you could talk to it, and it was pretty good because it disambiguated sort of by using gesture. So it would get the speech hmm, partly right, but this is 30 years ago. And then when people started to do it better and better, they looked at many things. Steve Jobs was here constantly, spent a lot of time uh, at the lab. I spent a lot of time with him. And NPR, our, our sort of public broadcast radio uh, network, did a very, very generous uh, program recently where they, they took one of my first TED Talk. I've given 14 of them. But my first one, they somehow, I don't know who recorded it. They, in fact, each year, the, the, the person who organized the TED Talks asked us to sign agreements to use it. And I, like a complete jerk, would always say, no, you can't use it. That's what it's, this is all done on the fly, and it's for the people in the room. Well, somebody clearly, and thank God, ignored whatever I signed and wrote. And the TED Talk was then compared to statements that Steve Jobs would make in public 20 years later. And I thought they were old in 1984 when I gave that talk, and they sort of didn't, uh, didn't uh, <clears throat> die quite as fast as I thought. But what, what happened, at, at least in my life, is the Media Lab, which, go back to the, got built, and Again, this is partly because of the gorilla in the front seat. What do we do? We build a building. Now, why do you want to build a building? The reason you want to build a building, in my opinion, 
is that you then don't have anybody telling you, you know, that how to sort of manage your space. Space at a university is like water in the desert. And so having your own building is a pretty good deal. Because then people aren't going to sort of push you around or say, we got to do this and that. So we built our own building. I was happy to do it. Um, and I was happy to spend the couple of years uh, it took, maybe three years, to raise the money to do it because I was doing it with Jerry Wiesner and it was talking about very many of the same things that this forum talks about, that people in this room stand for, that innovation would come from these different points of view and so on. And the lab then proceeded to grow in spite of the fact that most people at MIT thought it was a group of sissies. It grew literally 100% per year per year for the next 10, maybe 12 years. And so what happens when you grow, you know, actually 50%. What happens when you grow 50% per year per year for almost 12 years? Guess what? You build another building. And so we built another building. This one was a little bit less amusing to build because I had already done it once. But it was, again, a place where people could come that were, should we say, not necessarily welcome other places. And I have to say that the, that the mandate of the Media Lab, which I'll describe to you in, in very few, few words shortly, has expired. And now the mandate is different. Now the mandate is to be a place where you come where things look otherwise impossible. And this is the place to come. At the time, we had a much simpler description. And at the time, I described it as basically with the difference. What was the difference between television and photography in the following sense? Television was invented by engineers who then threw it over the fence to be used by whoever wanted to use it, however. Photography was invented by photographers. And as the photographer wanted to do something else, he or she, over the course of history of photography, kept changing in photography. And to have a medium that is invented by the creative users was really, in my opinion, what photography was, and really what television was not. And I said to whoever would listen to me at the time, the future of computers will be invented by the creative users. That was the punchline. So when there are people in this room doing startup companies, I hope some of you are part of inventing computers. Sometimes entrepreneurship and innovation isn't necessarily reinventing or coming up with a discovery. Sometimes it's a new business model. I'm personally less interested in that, but that's fine. Those can be very successful companies. I'm more invent interested in the invention of a technology or the discovery in science that then is morphed into uh, a company and into entrepreneurship. So second building, more people. And whoops, I guess I didn't. I thought I had loaded other slides. Um, what I'll do is I'll find the other slides and use them at the beginning of the, of the next talk. So I, I, I have some examples of, of current work. But let me just use the last few minutes to sort of describe what happened uh, over, the, over that period of time. As soon as a revolution becomes the establishment, which is, happens much quicker than you want, you actually have to spend a certain amount of effort to keep yourself crazy. Because, I mean, you can, you can very quickly, success is your biggest enemy in almost everything in life, but certainly in entrepreneurship. It is your biggest enemy, and very often the lead person moves on and does another one because they're just not made for what it takes to bring an institution further in size. And I found that personally, I, I was okay with it. And people liked it when I ran the media lab because I didn't bother them. So I ended off going doing other things in parallel, like starting Wired Magazine. 
when we started Wired Magazine, people said, what? This is really crazy. Why would you start something called Wired about this computer error and so on? So my recommendation to those of you who are doing startups is don't worry about, forget the financial exit something else, but don't worry about going off and doing another and handing it on to somebody perfectly responsible to, to, take, it, uh, to take it further. So to sort of end this, this half hour uh, and use a little bit more of the next one to add some slides that I thought I had here. Let me see if they're one, they're one slide further. No, um, they're not. <clears throat> to end it, let me just say, say the following. One of the reasons MIT is as interesting as it is, and those of you who've been there or remember it will, will attest to this, is that it's a place that accepts idiosyncratic behavior, idiosyncratic thinking. You really don't have to be in line with what the rest of the world thinks. And there's certain aspects that even I, you know, people will argue against me, is things like peer review, oh, come on. Things, some of those things that we take in the academic environment as so natural are things that just, you know, aren't good ideas. Tenure is not a good idea. We can go down the list of things that aren't great ideas, but the academic world is an extraordinary place, uh, MIT particularly, to do some big thinking. Now, what is my small disappointment? My small disappointment is the following, and it's, it's, this is an odd place to say it, but so many students now go off and start companies, I think, wow, it's gone the other direction. And the number of people who stay on to do big thinking has gone down. And that everybody's doing startup companies, and one of the things with startup companies is your investors tell you to focus. Focus, focus is, is for me a death knell. I mean, the last thing you want to do is focus, and yet, if you've, got it, if you've taken somebody's money, you no longer work for yourself, and when somebody whose money you've taken tells you to focus, you've got to at least listen. Even if you don't do it, you've got to listen. In my world, you don't even have to listen. You can say, you know, you don't belong here. So I've hit my 30 minutes on the dime, and that's partly because I'm missing some slides, which I'll put in for the next time I come back to sort of talk more about what's happening now and what I'm doing uh, now and in the future. Thank you.